This is a history of Western thought, number 16, Aristotle on virtue. Now, in our last video, we looked at Aristotle's perspective on causation. And as we looked at Aristotle's view of the four causes, we saw that Aristotle has an emphasis on teleology, meaning that Aristotle has an emphasis on things working toward a particular end or things working toward a particular goal in the natural world. And so as Aristotle develops his perspective on ethics, and particularly his perspective on virtue, he similarly sees that as something that is teleologically oriented. So according to Aristotle, all human actions are oriented toward a particular end. For example, if I were to go to the grocery store, I would go there for a reason. I probably wasn't just wandering around and happened to end up in a grocery store. I am there in order to buy food. Well, why would I buy food? I buy food in order that I may take that food home and cook it. Why do I cook food? I cook food in order that I might eat it. Well, why do I eat food? I eat it in order to get energy so that my body can function and do all the things that it needs to do. So if you think about any human action that we do on a regular basis, we do things for particular purposes. And I could go on and on about why is it that my body needs to function? What am I doing with it? And the causes could go on and on and on. This is what we talked about previously as final causes. Well, the final end, the final and proper end, or the final goal of all human action as it's properly ordered is happiness. For Aristotle, this is the final goal. It is only happiness which is an end in and of itself. So happiness is the thing that we are not trying to gain happiness in order to gain something else, that is ultimately the goal that we are shooting for. We're all trying to get there. So what exactly is happiness, though? That's the difficult question. Well, we spoke before when we looked at Plato's ethics about this notion of happiness. We talked about eudaimonism, which is the perspective Aristotle takes, which is a perspective on ethics that says to live an ethical life is ultimately for the purpose of achieving happiness. But happiness does not mean momentary pleasure in the way that we tend to use the term today. So by happiness, Aristotle, like Plato, means a well-lived and a well-ordered life. It is to live a virtuous life that is done in accordance with reason. So let's talk a little bit then about reason and what the role of reason is in Aristotle's system of virtue. Well, like Plato, Aristotle spoke about three aspects of the soul, but he does it a little differently than Plato. We have three kinds of souls. The first is a nutritive soul. Now, the nutritive soul is the soul that is the thing that is moving toward the reception of nutrients. So this would be something that humans do, certainly, or animals, but it's also something that plants do. We talked last time about the example of photosynthesis. So plants are oriented as well toward a goal, which means that they have a nutritive soul. They seek for nutrition and growth. The second kind of soul is a sensible soul. Now, the sensible soul is one's perception of the world, is to say that one can perceive the world that is around them. This generally is what we would think of as consciousness. We are conscious of things that are coming to us. We have senses that are engaged as we encounter things in the world. And so this is true not just of humanity, but of animals as well. But it's the third kind of soul that identifies humans and makes them distinct from the rest of nature. That is the rational soul. This means that humans have the ability to reason, which plants and other animals do not have. This is the reason for Aristotle's definition of humanity as the rational animals. A human is, by definition for Aristotle, a rational animal. And so it is rationality, particularly the principle of rationality, that distinguishes humanity from the rest of nature. And this rational aspect of the human person is going to guide and govern what it means to live the virtuous life. 
Because unlike other creatures, humans can actually think about directions. We can stop and reflect on what is right. We can reflect on what is wrong. We can look at the desires and instincts that we have. And instead of simply acting upon our instincts, we can ask ourselves, should I act upon this instinct? Should I restrain myself from acting upon this instinct? And that right use of reason is what governs and guides our virtuous lives. So what exactly is virtue? Now, Aristotle's ethical system is often referred to as virtue ethics. There's a whole school of thought today in philosophy known as the school of virtue ethics. So virtue really is at the very center of Aristotle's approach to ethics. But what exactly is virtue? Because people define virtue in many different ways. People probably disagree about what is virtue and what is a vice. Well, for Aristotle, virtue is what makes a path between deficiency and excess. For example, think about courage. If someone is cowardly, they are not virtuous because they will never be able to defend the honor of somebody else. They won't stand up for what is right in a time where they could be persecuted or face negative consequences for it. They could possibly do something wrong just to avoid having to deal with the consequences of doing the right thing if it could come back on them somehow. We may be tempted to think then that what we should have is the opposite of cowardice. We should go in the other direction as much as possible. Well, if you do that, what you have is brashness. And when someone is being rash, that means that they don't think before they run into danger. They don't stop and say, is this a wise decision? Is there any chance that I will actually succeed in what I am about to do? On instinct, they just do what they feel is right without stopping and thinking about it. So most of us would recognize that this probably is not where we want to go either. So between being brash on the one hand and and being cowardly on the other is courage. Courage means that we stand up for and do what is right. We are willing to accept the consequences. However, we don't do it without thinking about it. So then Aristotle, of course, as we speak about virtue, has a distinction between that or virtue and vice. Well, what is vice? Vice essentially for Aristotle is enslavement to excess. And so this is when we fall into excesses. We are not trying to temper our desires. We simply jump into whatever it is that we feel at the moment. Our reason is not governing our actions. Instead, our inner and innate desires govern where our reason goes. That is vice. Well, how then do we cultivate virtue? How do we live a life that is one of virtue rather than a life of virtue? vice. Aristotle believes that this is done by way of habituation. What I mean by habituation is that one gets into various habits of living virtuously and doing the things that are virtuous. So virtue takes practice. Now, at first, virtue, the practice of virtue may be something that is forced. You may be doing the things that are virtuous and not really want to do them. It may be something that you are perhaps forced to do because there is a negative consequence of you not doing the virtuous thing. This is especially the case with how we raise children. Oftentimes when we have a child and that child is doing something that they shouldn't do, that is not a virtuous action, we give them a punishment. So there's a consequence, a negative consequence for them not acting virtuously. Well, most likely your children don't just do what's virtuous out of the desires of their heart because they simply want to do what's right all the time. A lot of the actions that children do that are virtuous actions are really done simply because they don't want to get in trouble, or they know that they get extra dessert after dinner if they clean up the table, or if they don't fight with their brother or sister. But eventually, the more that the child does these things, the more that an individual practices these virtuous acts, the character itself begins to shift. So these things begin to become second nature. And the goal is that the thing that is done that is virtuous, even if at first it's simply forced or done out of wrong motives, that eventually it becomes internalized in the individual's character. And then they simply act virtuous because it is a part of who they are. So what this means is that virtue ethics 
as explained by Aristotle, has a focus on the building up of one's inner character. And this is going to distinguish virtue ethics then from some other later ethical systems, and plenty of other ethical systems at the time as well. For example, if we look at someone like Immanuel Kant, who has a very large influence on the field of ethics today, Kant believed that all ethics was the result of duty. In other words, we have a duty to do certain things as human beings, and to do the ethical thing is simply to obey that duty. You see, the emphasis is not so much on character as it is on the external act and aligning oneself up with the external act. Or we can look at other ethical systems that focus on the maximization of pleasure. We could speak about the ancient philosophers known as the Epicureans who did this. We could speak about hedonism, which is kind of the ultimate expression of just live for personal pleasure, and that's really all there is, and ethics don't really matter. Or we can look at it in a more sophisticated sense with something like utilitarianism that develops much later. The idea that when we make an ethical choice, the right choice is the one that brings the greatest amount of pleasure to the largest number of people. But all of these systems find their basis in pleasure. So rather than pleasure or duty, Aristotle believes that virtue or ethical decisions are really about the building up of one's inner character. And that then the external actions that one performs are the result of the state of one's character. So what exactly are virtues? What things does Aristotle see as virtuous? Now, there are, as known by many, four cardinal virtues in Aristotle's thought. The first of these is prudence. Prudence is essentially practical wisdom. It's knowing how to act rightly in various situations and how not to respond in certain situations. The second is justice, or what we often speak of as righteousness. This is judging fairly, being able to make a right judgment or decision in accord with the standards of justice. The third is fortitude. This is what we've already discussed as courage, when one is not brash, but is courageous and not cowardly. One will stand up for what is right and not be afraid. The fourth is temperance, or what we generally know as self-control. The ability to stop oneself from going into excess. So this is the opposite of gluttony. Self-control means that we can see a large plate of delicious food before us that would make us sick if we ate too much of it. And we can eat a portion of that and then stop ourselves from eating more. This is something that we all struggle with daily. It has to do with all sorts of pleasures in life. We often want to just grab onto pleasures without taking the time to think about whether or not it is good for us to partake in those pleasures or how much we should partake in those pleasures. And so a lot of Aristotle's ethical system is really about balance. It's not about denying the joys of life, but it's about understanding the proper ordering of the joys of life and not just indulging in them in excess. Aristotle's virtue ethics will eventually become highly influential in the development of virtue ethics in the medieval period, where we have the adding of the theological virtues of faith, hope, and love, as the Apostle Paul describes in the book of 1 Corinthians. After this, we are going to be doing our final study on Aristotle as we talk about Aristotle's approach to God.